Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Advantes with Ira Leventhal. We're going to talk today about silent data corruption. Ira, we've been hearing about silent data corruption for probably the past year or so. How big a problem is this and where is it showing up? One of the key ways where it showed up differently now is that you have the hyperscaler companies, the Googles, the Metas of the world, were very major participants in ITC this year, giving keynote speeches and other uh, major papers that were presented around this particular topic. In addition, there were several panel sessions to discuss this. So it's basically showing up as, the, as we create this massive scale of server and computing infrastructure. And this is why you have the hyperscaler companies now coming to the test community at ITC and other places looking for answers. And these hyperscaler companies are all developing their own chips these days too, right? Uh, that's correct. And uh, oftentimes those chips are new and different types of architectures uh, and uh, you know, really raising the level of design, uh, complexity, customization for specific applications like AI chips and so on. Let's take a closer look. Sure, let's do it. Ira, what are we looking at? Well, when I heard a lot about silent data corruption and all the requests from the hyperscaler companies to solve this problem within the test community, it really got me thinking about all of the different factors that are going into play. There was a lot of discussion, especially in the panel sessions this year at ITC, on is this a new problem? Is it just manifesting itself because of scale? And everyone's looking for the one answer to well, why is this important now? And it's really not just one answer. As I thought about it, there are so many different aspects that contribute to silent data corruption, now, starting with the process node shrinks. Uh, we're now seeing uh, effects at the, um, the, the physical level as the process nodes shrink. There's new and different effects that are causing errors, uh, error conditions that we didn't see before. But in a sense, it's, it's no different from every time you go down in terms of the process nodes you are seeing new and different errors and you have to account for those. But it's not just that in this case, there are many other factors that are coming into play here. Uh, you have advanced packaging, going to 2.5 and 3D packaging. Uh, not only do you have additional issues that can come into play from a packaging standpoint, but from a test standpoint, this is one of the challenges that Advantest and our customers face. We don't have the same pin-to-pin -pin access as we've had in the past for these devices. So, we really need to come up with creative ways to deal with that problem. Uh, the massive scale, I mean, this is why the hyperscaler companies like Google and Meta are coming to ITC asking for help in the first place. They're running at such massive scale, the problems that maybe we used to be able to deal with, like for example, our cell phone all of a sudden starts uh, doing something unexpected and we reboot it, that's not the kind of uh, a solution that's really going to work at massive scale. Design complexity and customization. We talked about some of the things like the AI chips and uh, other specialized architectures in chip design and the need to uh, turn those out fast, looking at time to market, uh, time to yield, time to dollars, time to quality. Uh, the needs are getting continually greater and more pressure putting on our customers. Mission critical applications. Uh, once again, if your cell phone uh, happens to, um, to all of a sudden shut down, it's not a big deal, you just restart it. But uh, the same can't be said of something like driving a self-driving car and all of a sudden the navigation sits down, sit, it shuts down when you're relying on that. I, um, uh, the um, you know, medical applications like uh, pacemakers, uh, there's so much brains in those pacemakers now, uh, which is a big advance forward, but you're also relying on that, that device to work correctly or else the, the, uh, the effects can be calamitous. So the greater use of mission critical applications uh, really highlights the issue of silent data corruption, that if something goes wrong, especially something that we're not able to realize right away that propagates through a complex system, uh, the results can really be disastrous. And then algorithmic complexity. Uh, a lot of people like to use the example with silent data corruption of you add one plus one together and you get three. Well, that's a pretty obvious thing, a pretty obvious issue that anyone could see. But if you're doing things like significant number of machine learning inferences, 
uh, with uh, um, these uh, uh, massive uh, computing infrastructures, those are the types of errors that can propagate through a system for a long time without being uh, obvious to either the casual observer or even the expert observer. One of the things that a lot of these system companies did that's different is they've each developed their own specific architecture based upon the data that they need and exactly what they need to do in order to improve their results. But they're different from one to the next, so it becomes a unique architecture that may be harder to find this stuff than in the past, right? Uh, exactly, and you have some very interesting examples of uh, ways in which the uh, device manufacturers are getting creative, but they are stressing these uh, uh, various systems and technology in different ways than in the past. For example, compute in memory. For the longest time, we just relied on memory to store some information and then get it back out. Uh, but now if you have compute going directly in the memory cells, you're now taking the technology and using it in different ways than before. Um, similarly with the uh, AI chips, you see a lot of very interesting uh, architectural approaches and hardware approaches that are being used there. Uh, for example, uh, you see now things like uh, analog AI chips uh, for to get greater levels of performance than if you uh, are representing everything in the digital domain. But once again, you're, you're using the silicon in different ways than it has been used in the past. You talk about stressing the silicon, and that's one of the issues here is that in the past, the utilization of some of these chips was much lower than it is today. A lot of these AI chips are set up for massive throughput and always on type of performance, right? Maximum full out as fast as you can go. Now you have things that may show up that you might not have ever seen before. Uh, yes, definitely uh, usage patterns very different, especially for something like uh, artificial intelligence, especially when it comes to a guidance system. Uh, the, you would previously see those types of things um, predominantly in military applications, where you could afford to spend a lot of time and money to get it right. Uh, but now when you see the proliferation of these technologies in all kinds of day-to-day -day applications, like the, with the guidance system, with uh, you know, more and more being used in, in self-driving or, or uh, assisted driving cars, uh, we're relying on these technologies on a day-to-day -day basis, and you have at the same time the pressure to keep these technologies at a reasonable level of cost. Like a car, for example, the amount of chips in that car has grown so greatly, but if all of those chips are tremendously expensive, then it's going to move the price of the car to something that consumers wouldn't be able to afford. And part of what drives up the price of those chips is also how much time it spends in the fab. The fabs are going to pass along that, that cost to whoever it is. The more inspection that you need, the higher the cost is going to be, so there's been a lot of pressure to keep the uh, time that you're inspecting, the time that you're testing down to a minimum. But what's going on here, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that we're going completely the opposite direction. We have to do a lot more of this. Well, we absolutely see the pressures. Uh, with Advantest, with our customers, the level of complexity of the chips is getting greater. The product life cycles are getting shorter. The amount of customization is getting greater. But at the same time, the test budget is not going up. And if the test budget ballooned out of control and, and caused the overall chip price to then go out of line, that is just not going to work from a, a business standpoint for our customers or at the end of the day for us. So we are under the same pressure to keep reducing test time. So we need to get more creative in terms of uh, how to solve the problems in smarter ways. It's no longer just doing things in parallel though, right? I mean, that was one of the ways that we cut the, the cost down in the past because we would do multiple functions at once as opposed to uh, just doing one single test, for example. Now what you're looking at here is not just testing the hardware, you're testing the hardware interacting potentially with the algorithms as well and the data that's moving through it. Uh, absolutely, and we think that's uh, a key to being able to solve the problem. And it really goes from looking not just, uh, let's say, how the chips are working in the applications, which that's something that we've made a big push for down the path of uh, system level test within advanced test, but really looking at the entire semiconductor value chain. How do you go from design 
all the way through to the manufacturing steps, the, the ATE insertions, system level tests, and then even how to gather performance data that you could use when the device is out in the field. And so we see a key part of this answer being, how do you bring all that data together? And not just the data, but how do you share the knowledge that's generated along with the data at all of those steps and bring that together in, in the most uh, efficient way to be able to infer uh, much more out of the data and optimize your overall process. And there, we, we see that as a key to being able to solve this problem. It can't just be focus on any one piece of the process, but really looking holistically across the value chain. Another challenge that fits in here is that you also have always had variation, and as you go down to the most advanced nodes and you start putting more chips together, you've got additive type of variations as well. How do you deal with that when you have variation and maybe the variation's off or maybe the chip is defective? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. It's not even just the question of how do you make sure that, let's say if you're gonna put a bunch of chips in an advanced package, not only are you looking to make sure that all of those chips are working together and that you didn't create problems in the assembly of that package, but at the same time, you have the pressure to keep the yield up. And especially when you have tons of chips going into a package, you have not only the problem of uh, that any one chip can take down that, that entire package, but you're really looking across the board at how to maximize the yield of uh, not, not just that um, end package, but of all those chips, you're trying to maximize the amount of revenue you're, you're gaining. So clever uh, approaches are being uh, used like, can you match up different chips? Can you use the data to say, okay, if we put together this group of chips, they're gonna work together. The more you can do that proactively, then this is how we can help our customers get the most out of the money that they're putting into manufacture the chips. And when you're searching for reliability issues or things that cause a problem, you're looking not just at the hardware, you're also looking at potentially the algorithms. And those algorithms are really complex and they're based upon data which may or may not be flawed, right? Yeah, the algorithms are uh, not only complex, but a lot of variation in the types of algorithms that may be run. Uh, and that's one of the challenges with uh, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning is for any given problem, uh, there's no one um, magic algorithm that's going to solve all the problems. So you can't just test your chip saying, okay, it can perform that algorithm correctly. You don't know how the chip is going to be used at the end of the day in all the various applications that you could uh, apply it to. And new algorithms are being generated all the time. So you could think that you have tested your chip with the uh, a representative sub subset of all the algorithms that are out there and then next year you could have your new set of even better algorithms and find out that for some reason your chip uh, is uh, is faulty in terms of uh, one of those algorithms and then that's uh, once again the kind of thing that's going to lead to problems with uh, for our customers that we want to help them solve proactively rather than having to react to these issues when they come up. So what does test look like going forward, maybe five years from now? What changes in this? What I see is that test uh, becomes more of just focus on a single insertion and look at how you do that insertion most effectively. Uh, for example, saying, just thinking that your problem is, okay, how do I accomplish this wafer sort test? If you're just focused on that one piece of the puzzle, you're really gonna be missing out on how to solve the overall problem. So I think you need to look to how you can put together multiple technologies to get the job done in better ways. For example, to solve the problem of the advanced packaging and losing some of the pin to um, uh, individual pin access that you have for your less complex uh, uh, packaging solutions, can we have better sensor architectures for on chip where we can access that data during test and use that data together with some of the more classical data that we collect from an ATE insertion to uh, be able to both uh, weed out the, the, the chips that are not performing correctly, but also be able to do some of the things like matching up the chips that are gonna work best uh, within a package and also feeding back that information to previous process steps to help improve the overall quality and yield. So is test still a discrete step then, or is it part of an integrated suite of all sorts of things that have to be done? I believe the answer is both. 
We will continue to have these discrete test steps, but they need to be thought of in the context of the complete process from design all the way through to even out in the field and being able to gather data from there. And if we don't do that, I think we're not going to be able to, to uh, solve some of the what I'll call the needle in a haystack type of problems where the effect may not even necessarily show up just from the data that you capture from a single insertion, but may have to be uh, detected by putting together data from multiple steps of the process. And just to drill in here one, one last time, the silent data errors were not just a result of one thing. It was a, a series of things that came together to, to uh, create those errors, right? Well, yeah, so this various uh, set of conditions, this is what I believe is all working together to create this problem. But getting down to the specifics of what's really going on at the chip level, at the physical level for what's causing these problems, there's a lot of work that's still left to be done there to sort that out. But I think things like uh, data analytics, uh, better sensor capabilities, a better thought out uh, test process, really looking at the entire value chain end to end, these are all going to be key parts of the solution. Ira Leventhal, thanks for a great explanation. Thanks for inviting me, Ed. It's been a pleasure.